Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today online and in person here at New America in Washington, DC. Um, we're thrilled to have this conversation co-hosted by the Brennan Center and New America. Um, so thank you again for joining us. And for those of you who are in person, thanks for joining um, during a beautiful spring day here in Washington, DC. My name is L.B. Eisen, and I am a senior director at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law in New York City. I'm thrilled to moderate today's very important conversation. A few weeks ago, the Columbia University Press published a series of essays called Excessive Punishment, How the Justice System Creates Mass Incarceration. It's a book that unpacks why the criminal legal system in the U.S. is so punitive. These essays focus on America's inability to rein in this punitive excess of the criminal legal system. And essays cover a range of issues from policing to prosecution to a lack of resources for public defenders all across the country to prison conditions to life after prison and the more than 40,000 rules, regulations, and laws that make it very difficult for people to successfully rejoin their communities after a conviction. These essays specifically explore whether these systems could have evolved differently. And how can we today, in 2024, learn, learn from America's failed experiment with mass incarceration? How can we advance reform that respects human dignity, does not exacerbate conditions of poverty, and promotes healing and racial justice? Many of these essays point out that even at times of rising crime, it is critical not to respond with the kinds of policies that produced over-incarceration in the United States. We can't respond with policies that perpetuate the status quo. There are better ways to respond, and some of the essays in this series highlight those approaches that have proven effective to reduce violence without driving prison populations even higher and exacerbating racial disparities in America's justice system. Here to discuss ways to reimagine the justice system in the US, we're joined by Ted Johnson, who is a senior advisor at New America and the author of When the Stars Begin to Fall, Overcoming Racism and Renewing the Promise of America. A retired US Navy commander, after a two decade career, he served as a White House fellow and as a speechwriter to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Before New America, Ted was my colleague a senior fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice, where he directed the fellows program. Immediately next to Ted is Nicole Porter, named a civil rights leader by Essence Magazine for her work to challenge mass incarceration. Nicole manages the Sentencing Project's state and local advocacy efforts on sentencing reform, voting rights, and confronting racial disparities in the criminal legal system. Since joining the Sentencing Project in 2009, Nicole's advocacy and findings have supported criminal justice reform in several states, including Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri, California, Texas, and the District of Columbia. And I know that's just scratching the surface on the number of states you've worked in and where your advocacy has um, Im impacted positive change. Immediately next to Nicole is Ed Chung. Ed is the vice president of criminal just is the vice president of initiatives and a member of Vera's leadership team. I forgot my reading glasses. I'm so sorry. They're they're in the back. So I'm holding the paper in front of me. Um, Ed has two decades of legal and policymaking experience, including positions in the White House Domestic Policy Council and the US Judiciary Committee. As a senior advisor at the US Department of Justice, Ed worked on some of the Obama administration's signature priorities, such as the My Brother's Keeper Initiative, the Task Force on 21st Century Policing, and Ending the Criminalization of Poverty. 
Ed started his career as an assistant district attorney in Manhattan, then as a federal prosecutor in the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division after that. Thank you so much for joining today's conversation. Nicole, I'd love to start with you. You've worked to improve the criminal legal system for decades. And you recently organized a campaign with dozens of organizations who felt it was important to highlight that the year 2023 marked 50 years of mass, incarcer of mass incarceration in the United States. Can you talk about the, that coalition, the campaign, why this effort was so important and some of the work that that coalition um, has accomplished over the last year? Yes, and thank you so much, LB, and to New America for having this conversation this afternoon and to the Brennan Center. Um, you know, I think what was important about that campaign, and we talked about the importance of narrative, and what's important about this book is that it, the hope was to start a conversation grounded in the work that people are doing, the research that has been documenting the experience around mass incarceration at the time, um, marking 50 years, now over 50 years, to talk about what the impact of these policies and practices have been. And to have it be a narrative campaign, because the Sentencing Project and the Brennan Center and Vera and other, in New America and other organizations were doing the work in 2023 when we started 2023 and you know, talking about issues with sentencing and what was driving incarceration, talking about issues with policing and what was driving arrest, talking about the impacts of those policies, not just on the justice involved people, the legal system involved people who were directly impacted, but also on the communities. And trying to draw connections to what are the purpose of these policies and is it contributing to the goals that people are expressing around strengthening community safety, around um, hopefully preventing crime and preventing harm to begin with. And so the focus of that campaign, and I think what is the possibility of this book that you know we'll get into, is to frame the issue, to be bolder, to be more imaginative, to create the space intellectually and rhetorically through intentional narrative conversation. So we launched the campaign in the early part of 2023. We had many virtual conversations and we can even talk about like the impact of how things have shifted since COVID and the possibility of creating homes, political homes, conversation-based homes, narrative homes for people touched by mass incarceration and how to use those experiences, work with those experiences to try to um, reorient the country away from excessive punishment, given the title of the book. And in that first virtual conversation that launched the narrative campaign that the Sentencing Project anchored last year, there were over 1,500 people that registered for that campaign. I mean, that registered for that virtual conversation. Those included colleagues and organizations, staff from Vera um, participated in that uh, virtual conversation. Uh, leadership with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation participated in that virtual conversation. But on on um, the virtual room, in the virtual room in Zoom land, where people directly personally impacted by mass incarceration, whose loved one has been incarcerated, who themselves may have been a victim of crime, but also understand uh, people being held accountable by the criminal legal system. Some of those punishments far are disproportionate to the underlying crime that might have uh, contributed to their criminal sanction. So the fact that 1,500 people registered for that event, some with organizational homes, others individuals um, suggested to us, um, reminded us that there is a large community of people out there personally impacted by this issue. And the conversation in hoping to 
draw attention to the 50th year mark around the prison population going up since um, the early 70s and calling attention to the policies that contributed to the high rate of incarceration in the United States helps to, to give people a space to think about, well, what could we be doing differently? And throughout 2023, we, um, the Sentencing Project, along with partners, um, continued to publish um, new research, continued to try to shape the narrative through intentional media strategies and earned media attention, and also continued to figure out a way to create spaces where people directly impacted by the system, people who've survived incarceration, people still um, living through incarceration, their family members, practitioners who believe that there should be other ways to approach the criminal legal system, create spaces throughout 2023 and, and beyond now that we're um, through the first quarter of 24 to allow people to rethink and contribute to an ongoing conversation around that. And I think that there is strength in narrative and I am so interested in how the book will continue to drive that conversation nationally and um, in different jurisdictions around the country. Thank you that, for that, Nicole. And 1,500 people is an incredible number and really shows that there is a broad public interest in how we can reshape and reimagine the narrative um, because the status quo is not working. And part of the reason that um, we wanted to publish these essays is to reach the broader public. Um, so there are essays in this book that um, are written by people who are formerly incarcerated, academics, researchers, and you know anyone who's interested in learning more about this subject can pick up the book and read a couple of essays. They don't need to read the whole book. Um, so we're really trying to, to shape hearts, you know, change hearts and minds. And Ted, you contributed a beautiful essay in this collection when you were um, a fellow with the Brennan Center called How Punitive Access is a Manifestation of Racism in America. And in your essay, you note, in the end, the United States has a system in which justice is delivered unevenly and at times arbitrarily. You wrote, it's as if structural racism compels Lady Justice to lift her blindfold and slant her scales, forcing some of her people at the margins to tumble off the edge beyond her reach. It is such a beautiful piece of writing. And I have to tell you, I've read your essay dozens of times. Ted, how do racial disparities in the criminal legal system feed a punitive society rather than a liberal one? I, I appreciate the, the question and the, the, the kind words. Um, uh, so, and, and I actually begin the essay with this. Um, I had always thought that mass incarceration was the product of three things, of, of racism, the war on drugs, and uh, frankly, a, a need to convey to the public that they're safe, that, that, they're, that the country is, is a, a, a safe place. Um, and, but the idea then is if you reduce mass incarceration, then racial disparities will also be reduced, and that's just not true. Um, research has shown that really since the onset of the prison system in, in the United States, racial disparities were immediately present. And a lot of times, jurisdictions used prison as a way to recoup the labor that they had lost after the passage of the, the Reconstruction Amendments. Um, so at its inception, prison was a racially... Um, unjust system, racially disparate system. And as more folks have been locked up, especially in the last 50 years, that racial disparity has held, held, has held true. To the point now, you'd be hard pressed to find um, a black person in the United States, I can only speak from my experience, that isn't one or two degrees away from someone who is currently or has been previously locked up. Um, and uh, that's in, in a nation of 350 million. That should not be the case. But in a nation that incarcerates more people than anyone else, um, it's almost unavoidable. And so a, a liberal democracy, and so it, the way it connects to liberal democracy, you know, liberal democracy is basically a system where a majority rules, but the rights of the minority are still protected. And our prison system 
that latter part, it fails on that score. Uh, if you look at uh, sentencing disparities between crack and cocaine and who the, the, the users of each of those drugs are, either in real life or stereotypically, um, those, the, the black drug, those who are convicted of, of selling or using that are sentenced to longer time. Um, uh, and not only in the drug, uh, the drug of choice, but the, the length of their sentence, their ability to get a, you know, a defender that will uh, make a case for them to, to maybe just have parole and not, not go to jail, who the police stop, disproportionately people of color. Um, and so at every step, it's like the racism that's at the encounter gets crystallized as you work your way through it and as inequality begins to uh, com you know, affect the system more. So it's really, in, it's really difficult to say that we're in a, a just liberal democracy when the very people who um, have been minorities in the country, either racially or otherwise, um, are the folks that bear the brunt of this system. And so this, this, uh, this picture of Lady Justice, you know, not being blind and kind of peeking to see what color is that defendant? Oh yeah, they get five more years than the other person. And um, what color is the driver? Oh, we should stop them and not someone else. That, that's real. And, and I should say that in the initial conception of Lady Justice, she has no blindfold. And as Americans, we, I think the fulfillment of our liberal democracy, especially as large and multiracial as we are, is a Lady Justice that doesn't need a blindfold because in a truly racially, equal society, the color of one's skin shouldn't matter on whether they get stopped or how many years they get. So it it's feels good to say it's good that, that justice can't see because then we all get treated equally. Well, this book says otherwise. You know, people's lives, lived experiences says otherwise. So the fulfillment to me of a liberal democracy in a multiracial large nation is one that where race really doesn't dictate one's life chances in the system. And uh, we've got a ways to go before we get there, but uh, I, I think the, the question has been called and, uh, and, and lots of folks are working on that problem. So, you know, Ted pointed out we're a country of 350 million people um, and, you know, we have local jails, state prisons, federal prisons, and that's just the criminal justice system, right? We have dozens upon dozens of immigration detention centers. Some of the people there will then go back and forth between a jail and a prison. We have juvenile prisons. We have, um, you know, more places to lock people up, right, than, than any other country on this planet. We have two million people behind bars. Um, and that includes those who are in local jails, state prisons, and federal prisons. Uh, 70 million people in this country have a conviction. And about f between four to four and a half million people right now are on probation or parole. Um, so when we look at who's under some sort of correctional supervision, we know it's at least between six to seven million people. Um, so a vast number of humans are being held behind bars in this country. Um, and to Ted's point, it's, it's a big country, right? So Ed, you know, your essay highlights the federal government's role in reducing the negative impacts of the criminal legal system in this country. Um, you know, by and large, most people's experience with the justice system is at the local level, at the state level. Um, but you write in your essay, even if the president and Congress favored wholesale changes to the criminal justice system, they do not have a magic wand to wave. No one does. Um, still, there are ways that the federal government can influence criminal justice policy. Um, we all try very hard um, to advocate with the, with the federal government to send money to states to reduce the harms of mass incarceration, to improve public safety. And you contributed an essay to the book that describes the federal government's levers, what the government at the federal level can do to reduce the punitive harms of the justice system. So for those who are here in person and, and joining us online, what can the federal government do to make the justice system more equitable? And a second part question, um, 
Can you also speak to some of the progress that was made when you were working for President Obama and in, some, in the subsequent administrations since he left office? Well, I got to first say that talking about the federal government is not as poetic as what, uh, what <laughs> Ted uh, wrote or described. Um, I mean, I think it's, we all in this room and we all in this audience probably know that, you know, this, there's not one criminal justice system, there's not one public safety system in this country. And uh, it's even more than the 50 states and the federal system. It's county-based and uh, it's so thousands of counties that are there, cities and so forth. And all of the intermingling that happens with government structures in this country, um, that comes into full force when it comes to the criminal justice system and the public safety systems that we have. And, um, you know, what's striking is, you know, what Ted mentioned about the racial disparities, even with all of those systems, we have those racial disparities. Mm -hmm. It's not like we have racial disparities in one place, I mean, that are it's markedly different. It's, it's, it proliferates in our country, even with all of these different systems. Um, you know, I had, the, I had the privilege of working in the federal government um, during the Obama administration and even preceding that as a, as, a, as a prosecutor at the Civil Rights Division. And what happened during that time really emphasized and showed both the, the power of the government and the power of an administration, but also its severe limitations. Um, and I think there are three or four things, a few of these I highlight in the essay, of where you can really make progress with uh, federal levers. One is, as we all know, the, the president has a bully pulpit. And I think that's really, you know, sometimes we just say that. On this issue, it's really important because, you know, as Nicole was saying about narrative and messaging, in, in the second term of the Obama administration, President Obama was out there speaking about these things, whether it was, um, you know, from the Trayvon Martin incident, whether it was Ferguson and the killing of Michael Brown, whether it was uh, visiting prisons, uh, and what the first sitting president to visit uh, prisons and speak to people who were incarcerated. Um, this was something that also then, I would say, I wouldn't say caused or correlated, but at least coincided with a national movement um, for uh, addressing criminal justice and criminal justice reform. Not to say that um, there wasn't work happening before that. There was tons of work happening in communities and states across the country way before then. But to have a national profile and to have this as an issue that consistently for at least those few years and the years after that were ranked in polls as a top issue that's facing our country, that's something that the president and the administration can talk about. And we see the change now. We see how the, the administration, the, you know, the Trump administration and even the Biden administration talk about criminal justice and public safety. It's different. And then you have to think about, well, is criminal justice reform and ending mass incarceration still a priority for our country? What is the president's role in talking about that in making that a priority for the country? How much does the public then view what's happening across the country based on what the president says and what the president thinks? I think that's really important to consider. The second one, from the administration point of view, I had the uh, opportunity to work at um, the Department of Justice, and uh, for the last two and a half to three years, I worked at the Office of Justice Programs. And for those of you who don't know, that is the grant-making, training, and technical assistance arm of the Justice Department, where a lot of public safety and criminal justice dollars are sent to uh, different organizations, educational organizations, state and local governments. And there is there, those are based on appropriations that are passed into law and authorizing language that Congress passes. But also, there's a lot of flexibility in that language about the administration, how those dollars are administered. And so when we're talking about things back then about building trust between communities and police, or when we're talking about addressing fines and fees and how, uh, how systems and how different states should look at their fines and fees and make sure that they are trying to analyze where they're being oppressive on people coming out of or be, who are impacted by the system. Those are things where I believe the funding sources uh, really can help. The parts where I found were pretty limiting were uh, working on things where it's not ensconced in law. And anything that is happening from an administration, obviously the next administration, if they don't have the same 
philosophy as you do. They can come in and change anything that is not based, again, in law pretty easily. And that's what happened when the Trump administration came in with a lot of executive orders that were passed, executive orders that had to do with things like uh, military equipment and how military equipment were was sent to um, uh, local law enforcement, or charging decisions by the federal criminal system and the U.S. attorneys, and how, uh, you know, during the Obama administration, there was a uh, an effort to look at charges, not as the most punitive thing, but uh, to take into consideration all of the factors that uh, is facing a, a particular uh, case or an incident or a person, um, not the highest possible charge or the highest sentence that can get the uh, most severe uh, uh, penalty or, or, or term of incarceration. And so when you see, for example, you know, on day one or month one, the next administration come in and, you know, literally with a stroke of a pen, can overturn what the previous administration did by executive order, you see the limits of that. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, the, the, there is no direct supervision of other state systems by the federal government. Um, and so there is that kind of limitation of what the federal government can do. But one place where the federal system or the, or the federal government also in the administration can affect is there is a large federal criminal justice system as well. Um, and these are federal crimes. And it, it comprises the Bureau of Prisons, uh, comprised approximately 10% of all people incarcerated in the country. Um, and so there is a lot that can happen there. But those things are also governed by federal statutes. And so unless you can change laws, unless you can reduce the harms of federal laws that are already on the books, it's really difficult to make change from the federal, um, fr at the federal level. I don't mean to end that uh, the, and this part of the conversation by being so down about it. So I, I know that we'll be talking about more things, but there are a lot of other opportunities that, that are out there that the book also um, uh, gets into. Your comments really highlight that for those who want to make change and want to improve public safety and reduce the negative harms of the criminal justice system, there are multiple levers. So the federal government is one of those levers, just not the only one. And speaking of um, laws and executive orders, Nicole, this is an election year. It's 2024. Um, there is no shortage of um, tough on crime rhetoric um, that we're seeing in the states, at the national level, at the local level. And we're also seeing, while we've seen tremendous positive changes in the states over decades, um, we have seen over the last year some regression. And we've seen some states regress on criminal justice reform, reverse course, for example, this year, um, Louisiana, which is a, a state that, um, you know, I, I worked in when I was working at the Vera Institute um, on the Justice Reinvestment Initiative, and you know, a group of us um, from from Vera and Pew and so many other organizations worked with so many policymakers and stakeholders in Louisiana to. Um, improve their criminal justice policies and reduce their future um, prison growth. And um, this year, Louisiana repealed the 2017 Raise the Age Bill, which now allows 17-year-olds to be tried as adults. We've recently seen in Georgia, the state legislature passed Senate Bill 63, which would restrict the number of times that people and organizations, um, such as bail funds, can pay bail. Why do you think it's so hard to convince the American public that progressive justice reform policies can go hands in hands with public safety? Because we know the research indicates we're not creating safe communities by trying 17-year-olds in adult court. We're not creating safe communities by passing three strikes laws, by increasing the time people spend behind bars. We know so much about um, alternatives to incarceration, diversion programs, investing in our communities that we've never invested in. Why is it so hard? And, and do you think we'll ever get to a place where we can better inform 
the public that we can have both. We can have a more proportionate and fair justice system and safe communities. And it's a big question. Well, but I'm, you know, but my response is, I mean, I have to believe that we can, you know, and I have to believe that conversations like this one and the contributions in the book contribute to that because if not, then what are we doing? <laughs> you know, like literally, I do think the issue with how you framed um, where we are and how 2024 has started off is that it is so dominant um, to respond to crime and harm with punitive, with punitiveness and to rely on the status quo, criminal legal apparatus um, with adding more policing, assuming that disappearing people to prison is the response to harm caused by crime and crime breakers and that the criminal legal system and the way that it's oriented and the size that it's been allowed to grow over the past uh, many decades is a legitimate response to the harm that people experience and survive um, through and um, some have to live um, you know following the you know the deaths of loved ones um, and I think what needs to happen to contribute um, to reorienting the country in a new direction to addressing the excessiveness of punishment is to understand that there are other ways that people live with those other ways. In communities that are um, well-resourced, that are the communities where people imagine safety and experience um, what they can imagine, the response to crime breaking isn't to rely on a heavy police por um, force. And there is crime breaking that happens in those communities, but the response is a different one than the response in high incarceration communities that are um, where there's a, a very large police presence, where the response to social problems has been through the criminal legal system as opposed to building out a social services infrastructure to address community safety that disentangles how people experience solutions um, to social problems away from the criminal legal system. I mean, I have you introduced me, you said you've been working this issue for decades, and I've been in enough meetings to hear criminal legal practitioners hoard the resources and advocate for the resources so that they can be the delivery of mental health services to the legal system impacted people that they come in contact with and to validate the use of the criminal legal system locally at the state level um, to reinforce the idea that those services must be delivered through the criminal legal system, that the people who are legal system impacted, that being arrested, being um, incarcerated in a jail, going through a court proceeding, perhaps getting sentenced to prison or community supervision sentence is the legitimate course of action for people in need of services um, to receive those services as opposed to there being some alternative infrastructure that is developed in this country that can guarantee access and the delivery of services to the most marginalized residents among us. So in order to address the moment we're in, in 24, given how the year started off in Louisiana, given the rhetoric that may continue to drive um, punitiveness because of the political moment we're in, I think we have to identify the stories where people are thriving in spite of harm and in responding to crime breaking in ways that doesn't reinforce punitiveness and have that be a part of the conversation and the response. And that is happening. There are violence, there are successful evidence-based violence interruption programs in New York City, in Baltimore, in Chicago that have been proven to help reduce homicides and serious offending. There are alternative, there are diversion programs in New York. Um, Vera has helped to blaze trails on some of these programs that have helped to divert people with serious 
offense histories away from imprisonment by by addressing what they did to be diverted into the program, creating pathways for accountability, but then also effective programs that reduce future contact with law enforcement, reduce future arrest. So giving people those examples that public safety, community safety, isn't just exclusive to policing, isn't just, um, uh, shouldn't just be centered on the punitiveness of the prison system, that there are other ways. There are other solutions that can help reorient the country away from the punitiveness that's been dominating its systems for the last many decades. And to highlight those stories and to give people those examples is something that we need to be very focused and concrete on doing. I love that. And this idea of being concrete about solutions is so important. You know, we know, um, you know, you mentioned some of these violence, um, these programs that reduce violence. Um, we know that streetlights, you know, just having more streetlights in our communities actually reduces crime. And we all want our children to be safe walking to school, walking home from school, walking around at night. But there are so many concrete solutions that I know we in this room talk about, but, but sort of more broadly, um, it would be great for policymakers to be highlighting um, after school programs that we know work and strengthen communities, green spaces in communities that we've never invested in um, really can play a role in improving community wellness, reducing crime. And these are, you know, this is just scratching the surface in terms of solutions we know that can strengthen communities, um, reduce violence, reduce crime without over relying on the criminal legal system. And Ted, building on what Nicole just spoke about, it is difficult to convince Americans that a more fair and just approach to social harm can coexist with safety, with safe communities. Um, what will it take, in, in your opinion, for us to achieve more justice, equal opportunity, and a better functioning democracy when for so many Americans, punishment is, is what they think makes our communities safe? It's, it's such a hard question. Um, I don't wanna say that America is a punitive nation, but we are a nation that wants people to be penalized when they break the law. And um, that penalty, too often, prison or jail is the easy solution instead of some of these more resource intensive, e even if more effective methods that require you to engage the people instead of treat treating them like they're the worst day of their life or their worst offense. Um, I will say that, so for, for example, we were talking about the First Step Act just before um, we came on stage here. <clears throat> This is the act that was signed into law by uh, Trump um, that essentially affects a part of the federal prison system, reduced uh, the prison population by recalculating how good behavior happens, doing things that should have been done a long time ago, like not shackling pregnant women. I mean, that's just something that we were still doing. Giving them free sanitary Right, free, right. Uh, so, so, but, but I, there were two days that stand out, and I think Ed might have been uh, certainly there with me on one of them. One day we're with uh, then-Senators Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, and Dick Durbin talking about the First Step Act. And the question or the, the issue was about racial justice in safe communities. And then the next day, um, the Trump administration invites some folks over. Uh, I, I was in the room with Kushner and uh, uh, some conservative nonprofit groups and religious groups. The conversation there was not racial justice. Um, the conversation there was about redemption in terms of religious sort of second chances and the cost it takes to incarcerate someone and how that's a waste of taxpayer money. And so it felt a little icky to me, honestly, to be talking about racial justice in one room and then how to save taxpayers more money in the other room when we're talking about people's lives. But the narrative work, uh, to, to Nicole's point, is so important because that is how you move people's hearts and minds, not by showing them the charts and the data and the, the statutory language, which is all important, but um, when people understand that the folks that have been incarcerated are people and not statistics alone, and they're not walking threats to them and their way of lives. I think they're, they're more open to these kinds of things. The, the um, one example I'll give, and again, this is a, 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 something the Brennan Center has worked on for decades, is uh, Amendment 4 in Florida, where the people in, in Florida decided 
they were asked the question, should folks who have been convicted of felonies be allowed to vote once they've served their debt to society, paid their debt to society? And 65% of Floridians said yes. And so the people already get it. And a lot of it's because a lot of those folks, no matter what their class is or was, what their race, ethnicity, religion was, they all kind of knew someone one, two, three degrees away from someone who had been incarcerated. And that's the only way you can get a state like Florida to get you know 65% of, of Floridians doing the same thing, wanting the same thing, and the government blocked it. So the the you know the, the governor of Florida, the state assembly in Florida, <clears throat> prevented full implementation of this ballot initiative that the people of Florida demanded by an overwhelming majority. So to, for me, and this may be a little Pollyannish, but I think the long pole and the tent aren't the American people. Uh, the long pole in the tent is trying to get the government to be more responsive to the will of, of, the, of the people. And, you know, I, I talk about this a lot. You know, I, I run this Us at 250 program here at New America, uh, which talks about when the country will turn 250 years old in 2026. The declaration says that government derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. Well, the governed gave their consent to restore the voting rights of those Floridians, and government didn't bend. Um, that's a problem, and it's, that, that's a problem that extends beyond um, the criminal justice system or the criminal legal system, but it is one that is probably most tangible in that system because of the way it completely disrupts the lives of those incarcerated, the lives of the communities that they've now been taken from, and the lives of the communities, of, of the people in the communities that, that have been robbed um, of, of, of folks because of an unjust and uh, unequal um, justice system. So that reminds me of um, you know Jeremy Travis, um, who's a, a senior fellow at the Columbia Justice Lab, and Bruce Western, who's a sociologist at Columbia University, um, played a, a large role in in this book as well, and thinking through sort of themes of the book, um, and really encouraged us to think about the guardrails that we never set up to ensure punitive access was not perpetuated in the justice system. And they kept speaking about this democracy deficit. Um, you know, we elect our local prosecutors. We elect our local sheriffs um, in many jurisdictions. Um, we elect city council members. Um, we elect our um, state, you know, our legislator, legislators in state government and in the federal government. And for decades, We've elected representatives who promise public safety without really thinking through thoughtfully how to protect public safety without doubling down on these punitive policies, three strikes laws, more incarceration, longer incarceration. Um, and so this really is um, you know, a failure of our democracy. And Ed, you know, many of these essays in the book note how important it is not to double down on the punitive mistakes of the past um, when it comes to how we've over relied on our jails and our prisons. And in the book's introduction, I write, we need to prioritize reducing crime in ways that are fair, just, practical, and don't contribute to needless incarceration. And I think something we can all agree upon is that there is so much needless incarceration in the United States. You know, Ted, you spoke about this meeting at the White House where um, redemption was key to changing hearts and minds, where the cost of incarceration, I mean, you know, we all know these stats that we're spending billions of dollars on incarceration in this country. And um, there's just so much needless human waste, needless fiscal waste. Um, and, you know, Ed, I'm curious, how do we make concrete progress towards a more pro proportionate, more just, more equitable system, especially you know, given that every four years we have a, a major national election, we're sort of never ever removed from the politics of, you know, claiming you're tough on crime just automatically gets you votes. You know, how do we move away from that and, and how do we make progress? 
Again, a, a very <laughs> weighty existential question. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate the conversation here today about it's. It, this is a this is a government class, or this is a this is a subject matter that talks about our democracy and how government works in the context of the criminal justice system. And this criminal justice system is the government. Um, six of the first ten uh, amendments to the Constitution are criminal justice related amendments, um, and you know, so this is this is really important to talk about the the restrictions that we need to place on our government and how our government operates um you know i, I was uh i spent a short amount of time at the uh, in the u.s senate at the senate judiciary committee and um it, it was it was a really eye-opening experience um and i think one of the most um enlightening things to me was how easy it was to insert a provision in a bill that was moving and if it wasn't noticed it would just go and a lot of times it, that could be a criminal provision a criminal law provision uh we could increase this penalty from you know two years to four years uh we could put a mandatory minimum here, sentence here and even before all of the you know we've 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 been putting a spotlight on it more in in recent years but you know, imagine when the spotlight wasn't there, how easily something like that could be be included and inserted in there. And the one of the hardest things to do, and I touched on it a little bit in the essay, is is to roll back something that's already been put into law. And so I've always wondered, can we uh, put restrictions on our legislature, which obviously Congress and legislatures, that's something they will automatically champion um, no they won't but you know are there things that they we could put in there there are some rules that are in there already right we we have like a cbo congressional budget office rules for anything um, an analysis that has to happen uh, for anything that uh, requires a fiscal um, a fiscal effect there's fiscal note um, uh, uh, requirements in state legislatures and things like that can we can we put some some breaks on like that of analysis and evaluation and just pause a little bit, put a pause in there so that our politicians aren't, you know, something is, they're, they're not being reactive, they're not being politicians, they're, they're putting a little bit more thought to something when there are spikes in crime or when there are incidents that are out there, something to that effect. And, you know, to, to be quite honest, LB, this, that's a pipe dream, you know, it's, it's hard to, you know, to do that, but I think it takes, we have to think about it in that way to say, how do we restrain our, our government from overreaching the way that it has been? Um, I'll answer your question a, a different way as well. Um, there are already harms that are built into the system because of the laws that are passed and how the system is built. So there is, there is the reduction of harm with nothing else that needs to be built. There are some things that just need to go away. Fines and fees are one of those things that just just need to go away. A lot of pretrial incarceration just needs to go away without anything taking its place. And then there are other things that if it is replaced, there's a vacuum that needs to be filled. And a lot of things that I think, Nicole, you were mentioning things with CVI, uh, community violence interruption or, um, or intervention. Those are those things about how, if we take away this massive police presence or law enforcement role in our community and we just retract that suddenly is is there a vacuum that needs to be filled and i think communities take need to take a look at that and how do you fill that vacuum and what happens if that vacuum is not filled and i think you know we see a little bit over the last few years that yeah there needs to be something that comes in in order to show a better way and a different way to safety than than law enforcement it's it's it, it takes effort as a community f to to create safety safety just doesn't happen by itself um, and, and without any kind of effort so things like how do we support community groups how do we support nonprofit groups how do we support different civilian parts of government and 
how do you systematize that then? So how do you make that more systematized and make it more established so that that model is harder to take away, just like our current enforcement model is hard to take away? So there, I mean, I, I think identifying, uh, the way that I look at it, identifying what needs to just be taken away to take away because they are harmful and we don't need evidence to, like, we don't need a rigorous study for that kind of stuff. But then what are, when we do need rigorous evaluation study and, and something to put into place to replace uh, things that are harmful uh, and things that can continue harms if there's that vacuum that's un, unfilled, um, you know, I think it's, it's important to consider. These, this, the systematization to me is, is really important because, you know, we've all worked in areas where there are programmatic changes and, you know, a place like puts in a program for, you know, a pilot for a year and then, you know, p continues a pilot for another two years and then all of a sudden it goes away. So how do you keep that going and how do you make it more than a program and much more a part of the infrastructure and part of the system? That's a, a crucial government building uh, question that, that we have to have. That's such an important point, and I'm thinking about, um, you know, you mentioned fees and fines. Um, so many of us here, um, and, and I know online, work to eliminate fees in our justice system, right? Fees are just funding government infrastructure, court infrastructure, and it's tricky to figure out, well, how do you replace that funding, right? You know, the Brennan Center has published um, a lot of reports looking at the inefficiency of governments um, assessing and collecting fees. Um, and we know that after a couple of years, there's very little chance that the government will ever actually recoup any of that funding. Um, but it's really hard to find replacement funding. So um, I think you're right that there's just still so much deep thinking we have to do about what do we need in this incredibly complex criminal justice system that does span local government, state gov government, federal government, what can be just eliminated, and then how do we replace you know, some of those dollars um, is so critical. I know we have some online questions as well, um, so it'd be great to hear, hear those. Great, this question is from um, Anonymous. Are there any states you know of that are advancing restorative justice programs instead of mass incarceration? And if so, with what success? You know, I think um, rather than states, I think it's, it's localities. So, um, you know, one of the places that has been doing this for a while is, common, is an organization called Common Justice working in New York, um, and Daniel Sured. Um, there are also other DAs um, that actually have begun to partner with, um, with local groups on restorative justice uh, work. Um, and, and, and as a diversion, as a method of diversion, right? And so there's, a, you know, that's a different type of restorative justice. So just to, just to pull back on restorative justice, there's, you know, restorative justice is, a, is not a place in the system. It's, a, it's an approach um, and uh, it can happen at any time prior to involvement with the system, after involvement with the system, after, um, after you have a sentence, um, and so it happens while, while incarcerated. And so um, there are district attorneys uh, across the country, for example, that prior to or as part of um, you know, a sentence um, that, or a plea, plea agreement or, or the like, um, that's happening. So you know, just to name a couple, there's, um, I think in, in Memphis, uh, Tennessee, there's, there's one there. There are a couple places in Virginia, uh, locally here in Virginia, that are, that are looking at that. And so um, this is gonna be a plug, uh, LB, but uh, if you go to uh, the Vera Institute website and you uh, log on to the Reshaping Prosecution um, uh, page there, um, you, there you'll see you'll see the DAs that we work with on this, and also back in January there was a restorative justice uh, symposium that the Vera Institute put together that highlighted a lot of that, and you can find that on, on the website as well too. So thanks for the free plug there. And I'm sorry to cut the audience question short, but we only have a couple of remaining minutes, and I wanted to be. I'm sure that we had time to ask all of you one last question, um, sort of a lightning round. Um, so the question is, and if you can answer it in a couple of sentences. Um, so the question is, we, we've talked about the harms of the criminal justice system, this punitive excess, this lack of guardrails, um, how easy it is 
to add increased penalties in bills when people aren't paying attention, how easy it is to pass bills in state legislatures um, when people are afraid of, you know, one or two very, you know, in, in times of fear, right? You know, we've discussed how complex this is and how much work we all have to do to both increase community safety, but also reduce the harms of mass incarceration. And, you know, with the Brennan Center, we believe that you have to win in the court of public opinion before you can change policies, change laws, you know, really reaching people through their hearts and minds is, is incredibly important if you want to change policy. So I'd like to leave the audience um, with your answers to yet again another existential question, but what gives you hope that we can reimagine our justice system so that it is more proportionate, fair, just, and equitable? Ted, I'll start with you because you're sitting right next to me. <laughs> yeah, in, in two sentences or less. Um, no, you're right, I got you. <laughs> no, I actually think um, that when, when you try to tackle problems the size of the criminal justice system, with two million people behind bars, millions more um, on parole, probation, et cetera, um, problems like drugs and, and crime, and it's just too much. And for me, I find hope in when you humanize the problem, when you make the, the criminal legal system bite-sized, person-sized, um, people are more willing to engage with the folks that they would otherwise only want to lock up or only watch on like Netflix for entertainment. Uh, and so um, the, for, for me, it is, is recognizing that we are locking up people who, yes, maybe they've done something that's illegal or something that's bad, maybe, maybe they didn't, you know, the, the justice system isn't always sure about it, but um, treating them like people instead of like pawns in a system, um, that need that that we need to ostracize to keep us safe is it, to me is like the the foundational thing that needs to happen to to make this a human problem and not not just a systemic one. Cool. Yeah, I think what gives me hope is to understand how people have been able to thrive in spite of the harm that they've experienced and what they've survived. And that it's that thriving and that resiliency in spite of that I think is going to show another way and give examples of solutions that aren't just um, exclusive to incarceration and excessive punishment. You know, what brought me into this issue is the incarceration that my family experienced when my twin brother was incarcerated in the early 2000s. And the harm caused by his incarceration in the breaking of laws that he did and the harm and impact on my own family and what my family has had to survive and experience in result of that. And I know that if that's happening within my family, that it's touching the millions of people who are incarcerated on any given day and the family members and loved ones that are also impacted by their incarceration. And I know because of personal experience that people have been able to thrive in spite of, and so that is what gives me hope in thinking about what could come next and what we could all be contributing to. Um, a plus one on, on all of that. I, um, I find hope in, in the progress that we continue to see, even if we don't see it in the national headlines. I mean, I see, I see hope in Illinois um, implementing bail reform and continuing forward and um, with public safety continuing to um, to uh, not be compromised. Um, I see hope in um, the Biden administration um, giving hundreds of millions of dollars to communities for CVI and for alternatives and making it um, gun violence prevention a priority of the administration. Um, and then you see results of those types of strategies in places like Baltimore, which has historically been a place that had dealt with, has uh, dealt with persistent levels of, of, of crime, but there's, there's seeds working there in Baltimore or, or, or in Boston where you see, you know, record low uh, homicide rates and uh, record low um, just violent crime rates and how how crime and crime trends are diminishing and lowering without without the uh, the system like being 
blow, you know, blown up, ballooned, and so forth. So I see hope in the progress that's already been made that may not be recognized um, publicly everywhere. And I see hope in bipartisanship. You know, um, those of us here um, having this conversation have worked with so many different stakeholders um, who all believe that we can have a smaller, more humane, um, less racially disparate criminal justice system, that we can have community safety, we can reduce racial disparities, we can have fewer people in our prisons and our jails, and we've worked with stakeholders who come from very different backgrounds, ideological beliefs, and there's still a significant commitment to criminal justice reform in this country, despite some of what we've seen regressing at the state level. And I know that bipartisan coalition is still strong, and I have faith that it will continue at the local and federal level. Um, and I hope that, you know, for those of you in the room, we have politics and pros here. I'm selling this book, Excessive Punishment. For those online, if you're in the DC area, Politics and Pros is on Connecticut Avenue. They have this book in stock, um, or you can buy it from other independent booksellers um, or other booksellers of your choosing. And truly, there are just a significant number of essays from different perspectives, from different people who have been researching the system, impacted by the system, thinking about how to improve our systems of safety and justice without perpetuating over-incarceration in this country. So I really recommend the essays in this book. And thank you again for joining us today, both in person and online.